Welcome to The Hotspot. I'm your host, Armandez Fuliarajamandi. A few days ago, I asked my Twitter audience, what are your most pressing Helium questions? And you guys came up with some pretty interesting questions. So I'm here to answer them to the best of my knowledge. And why wait any longer? Let's get right into them. DYGO asked, what design decisions require Helium to have its own blockchain? I think there are multiple parts to this answer. First off, Helium requires a lot of transactions per second, and all the blockchains that were available in 2019, which basically boiled down to Ethereum and a few not very established competitors, simply did not have the block space available. Helium has a far greater capacity of transactions per second than Ethereum itself, and if the Helium functionality was built on top of Ethereum, it would have been extremely expensive to pay for the transaction fees, which would have hampered the network's growth. Also, there are a lot of functions in Helium that happen on repeated intervals, like proof of coverage challenges, for example. And these things are pretty hard to do with smart contract blockchains. You typically need to create what's called a crank, which is a special smart function that essentially is called by a centralized third party every so often in order to keep things moving. So Helium has a lot of specialized functions, whether it's the price oracle or proof of coverage or transferring hotspots. And these things didn't necessarily fit into the model of any other blockchain out there. So I think Helium would have ended up with a far inferior version of what they have now had they tried to shoehorn all this functionality into another blockchain from the start. But that doesn't mean that there aren't challenges. It is very difficult to scale a blockchain. And I can see that the Helium team is putting in constant work there just trying to get this thing to scale. They're lucky that they chose a great consensus algorithm in Honey Badger BFT. That has allowed the blockchain to remain stable for a long time, much more stable under the conditions that it endures than other blockchains would have been for sure. But at the end of the day, it's a huge technical challenge to continue scaling this blockchain. We're going to need to see continued innovation in order to keep that going. Moose asked, where are things with the redenomination? Any specific timeline on when it will go live and how long before exchanges will make the change? So Moose is referring to HIP39, the 1000 to 1 HNT redenomination. So essentially all HNT holders will have 1000x as much HNT, but each HNT will be worth 1 1000th of what it previously was. So effectively no change other than cosmetically you will see a higher number of HNT in your wallet. Now this vote was approved a few months ago in the HIP39, but DY has since announced that it will be delayed till August. Now, I was the one who led the opposition to the HIP39 vote, so one of my major criticisms of it was that the Helium ecosystem is quite large and is growing every single day, and in order to implement a change like this on a technical level, there are a lot of parties that need to change code and support the new 1000 to 1 redenomination, and this is a very complicated thing to do, to orchestrate all these independent parties. It will break a lot of people's code, and there will be a lot of stress put on companies that are already strained for developer resources trying to build in this nascent ecosystem. So DOI's delay until August is basically an acknowledgement of this exact reality from talking to exchanges, developers, API consumers, and anyone else in the Helium ecosystem who would need to technically implement this change. What does it mean for the future of HIP39? I think that's unclear. There have been suggestions that maybe HIP51 and 52, the Helium DAO proposal, could be used in order to create a 1000 to 1 split within the LoRaWAN DAO itself, solving a lot of the problem without having to redenominate HNT as a whole. But I think the longer that we wait to implement HIP39's changes, the worse it's going to get and the harder to implement it's going to get. So it's a bit of a catch-22, and I would not be surprised to see someone in the community open a HIP39 rescind vote to maybe undo the approval of HIP39. Steve Ward asked, why are no data credits being burned? This is a great question with a very subtle answer, and if you're not looking very closely and if you don't know the right people to talk to, things could appear very different than they actually are. So if you look at the DYETL or web3index.org, you will have noticed that data transfer was going up for quite a while, and then it dropped over the course of the past few months. Now, this was because there was a bug in state channels, and state channels are the on-chain mechanism that is used to keep track of which hotspots are to be paid for data transfer that they facilitated. And these state channels are created and maintained by the routers, and the routers are the entities which hotspots deliver data packets to so they can get to their final destination. Now, the bug with state channels was basically that 
When a state channel enters a dispute, which is basically when a hotspot complains that they did not get paid for data packets that they actually transferred, those disputes could pile up. There could be hundreds of disputes on one state channel, and the process for reconciling these disputes on the validator side was extremely expensive and actually caused a couple of chain halts and a massive block that was tens or I believe hundreds of megabytes. So. HIP56 has been proposed to fix this issue so that when there is a single dispute filed, the state channel will be closed and there will not have to be any expensive reconciliation and the chain can move on as normal without creating massive blocks. The reason I explained all of that is because due to this bug that has been latent and needs to be fixed in HIP56, data activity on the network has not been recorded properly on chain. Now, I have independently verified with people who run Helium consoles, including Helium team members, that the data transfer that you see on chain is not reflective of what's actually going through the console. In other words, data transfer on the network is working for people who are actually using it, but it's not being reflected on chain and the hotspots are not being properly paid. So until HIP56 passes, this will continue to be the case. This is another reason why, for example, you saw discovery mode turned off because it was exacerbating this issue. So it may take a few more weeks for us to see this fix happen, and after then we should have a much more accurate picture of the data transfer that is on chain, which from my understanding is quite a bit higher than what is being recorded right now. So the currently recorded data transfer on the chain looks like about $100 to $200 per day, depending on the day, but it fluctuates wildly. And the amount burned for transaction fees like hotspots, onboarding, and asserts still hovering about $100,000 to 150000 per day. So there is a lot being burned, but as far as actual data transfer usage, unfortunately, it's not currently being accurately reflected, and we will just have to wait and see what that number ends up at once the bug is fixed. Edwin M. asked, what has taken Helium and Helium manufacturers so long to sort software and platform hiccups each week for hotspot owners? Yeah, there have been a lot of issues due to the Helium Network's rapid growth, and the team has just been trying to keep up, especially on the software side. It's very much a case of being a victim of your own success. The fix to most of these issues from a hotspot owner perspective is HIP55. This will remove all hotspots from the peer-to-peer -peer network and will drastically improve the hotspot owner user experience and get rid of the blips and hiccups that Edwin is talking about. On the supply side, there are a lot of manufacturers now. I believe there are over 30 now approved manufacturers, which is just insane to me, considering that there was only one just over a year and a half ago. And a lot of the trouble with building hotspots just comes down to chip supply shortages. Every single Helium hotspot is dependent on LoRaWAN chips, and there's only one manufacturer. They're called Semtech. It's a proprietary technology. So if the Semtech chips are hard to get a hold of, that really puts a strain on the supply chain. Similarly, full hotspots, as in the ones we've all been able to purchase up to this date, the ones that follow the blockchain, they have mostly been based on the Raspberry Pi computers, which have been in massive shortage. It is very hard to get your hands on a Raspberry Pi right now. So once these shortages are resolved, just given the sheer amount of manufacturers that are in the space now, I expect that hotspot availability will improve massively. Light hotspots alone will make a big impact here because they do not have to be based on Raspberry Pi computers, they could be based on much lower, much more in supply computers that are much more like embedded controllers than they are like full fledged computers like a Raspberry Pi. And finally, Helium Inc. is not the one who actually manages this stuff. The Decentralized Wireless Alliance, DY, and the Manufacturer Oversight Committee are the players here who are actually overseeing the manufacturers, approving them for production, and penalizing them if things go wrong. And that penalty system is still in the works. So yes, there has been a lot of development in a very short amount of time, and everyone is basically scrambling to open up the floodgates of supply so that anyone who wants can purchase a hotspot and build the network. After all, that is the ultimate goal. Zarate asks, how much helium do I need to make myself float? So according to HowStuffWorks.com, it would take between three and 4,000 balloons for a smaller adult to float. That's about 14,137 liters of helium. I don't recommend trying this at home, and it definitely will not increase your hotspot performance. So if you're looking to float yourself, maybe to install an antenna in the sky, just know that that's more likely to result in death than more gains. Matt Mersch says, I'm very concerned about spoofing. I heard about someone on Reddit that has seven antennas on their house and is gaming the system. The thing to me that separates Helium from others is its utility. However, this starts to fall by the wayside when spoofing isn't addressed. 
I couldn't agree more, Matt, and spoofing is a really important problem that needs to be solved. Unfortunately, when you have any system where there is a monetary incentive to deploy something and there is money to be gained, there will be people who try to exploit it. And as you can see in every other industry where this is true, it is going to be a cat and mouse game for the entirety of Helium, at least as long as proof of coverage is around, which it will be for a long time. There are people working day and night to try to counteract this problem. As you can see, Helium Inc. has opened up the deny list, which has been extremely popular with the community. You can submit requests to add hotspots to the deny list on GitHub, and there are many requests being submitted. But this is not the most streamlined or efficient solution, and there will be more in the works here always. At the end of the day, people who are gaming the network and spoofing seem to be taking less than 20% of the rewards. Actually, probably far less than that, but I like to be conservative in my numbers. That doesn't mean it's not a problem, but it does mean that it's not necessarily causing massive losses for your average hotspot. It is something that should be addressed and kept tabs on though, and we should try to reduce it as much as possible using the most reasonable techniques that we can. It can be very hard to develop solutions because blockchains are an adversarial space where it's hard to bring in outside information without using something like an oracle. So this denialist solution that's in right now is actually quite unconventional for a blockchain project, and I expect other solutions to be developed in the future. There are a lot of smart people working on them, much smarter than me, and we'll just have to see how those solutions pan out. Connor M. Antico asks, when will we be able to trade helium on exchanges like Coinbase and Robinhood? Well, Connor, the ball is in their court. Coinbase, Robinhood, or any other exchange could list Helium at any time, given that it is a decentralized permissionless asset. They don't have to ask anyone in order to list it, they could just do it. I don't know what the exact reasoning is for listing or not listing an asset, but I can take some guesses. There are always questions around any asset, especially if it's a unique asset like Helium, which doesn't fit into a predefined bucket like a store of value or a DeFi borrow lend platform. There are a lot of questions around these assets, mainly whether or not they are securities. This is something that exchanges are very concerned with, especially United States exchanges where securities trading is heavily regulated. So you will see exchanges like Coinbase steer away from anything that might be a security. Now there have been no regulatory decisions on whether or not HNT is a security, and it seems that Helium Inc. stays out of the conversation entirely. They do not try to promote the coin. They have stated that it is a utility token, and that is what is meant to be used for. It is not meant to be a security. As for the definitions of a security, you could do some more research on YouTube if you don't understand that, but basically it comes down to are you profiting from the work of others. There also could be technical reasons why these exchanges wouldn't list Helium. For example, it's not simply a token on another blockchain like an ERC20 token or a Solana SPL token. For those tokens, it's quite easy for the exchanges to list them because technically all they have to do is just add another token address on their backend and now it's listed. But for a token like HNT, which is its own layer one blockchain, they have to incorporate the Helium node software into their backend. And that is a serious integration task that requires a lot of quality assurance and checking and balancing to make sure that the Helium blockchain and their internal systems work nicely together. Now there is a DY grant project which is well underway and I believe is nearing completion for something called Rosetta. Rosetta is the open source solution that Coinbase has made for anyone who wants to integrate a new blockchain into the Coinbase platform. So someone has already done the work to integrate the Helium node into the Coinbase platform. From a technical level, it's looking pretty complete. Again, the ball is in Coinbase's court to actually put the listing up there. They have openly stated in July of last year that they are interested in looking at HNT. So from my understanding, it is on their radar and there is not much clarity around what would prevent them from listing it. It could happen any day now. And if you're familiar with companies like Coinbase, they're not very transparent around listings, again, for regulatory reasons. So they probably will not say anything publicly about the exact reason why they will or won't list Helium. All I know is that it will be a great day for HNT holders when Coinbase does list, and especially for anyone who's looking for custody solutions outside of their own hardware wallet or other exchanges which might not have great insurance policies in the case of a rainy day. Ernest Opp asked, what is the usage of the network and why isn't there more transparency on that? As I said in one of the previous answers, there is currently a big disparity between what is actually flowing through the routers in terms of data packets and what is reported on chain. Now, I would love to see a router deployer, whether it's Helium Inc. or some other owner in the ecosystem, come out and share their data publicly and tell us exactly what the delta between actual packet usage and what's recorded on chain is. 
There's also another type of transparency that you may have meant here, which is why can't we see who is using the network and which types of devices are using the network? And this really comes down to a privacy and permissionlessness issue. If you want to have anyone be able to join the network, it is a huge deal for those people to be able to join the network completely anonymously and not have to share data about what they're doing or where they're doing it with anyone who might want to introspect on their business. Currently, anyone who's using data on the Helium network is only known to the router provider that they are interfacing with. And even then, those router operators might not have the most exact information on who exactly owns that console login or account, which they use to buy data credits to use with the router. This is not something I expect to change, but then again, if there were a router operator who was willing to publicly share an anonymized version of their console usage statistics, as in how many different independent parties are sending packets through their router, and what is the average number of devices, or maybe the max number of devices that any given party has, I think that would be some really interesting data to see and could really have a positive effect for the transparency story around the Helium network. And last but surely not least, Ben Abraham asked which hex is the most populated. So I ran some numbers here. I used hex resolution 8, which is the same hex resolution that is used by the Helium Explorer. And I discovered that the most populated hex in the Helium network at resolution 8 is hex 883D8D9B21FFFF in northern India with 387 hotspots in one hex. Their transmit scale is not looking too hot. Thank you everybody for your questions. If you love this content, please let me know in the comments down below if you're watching on YouTube or join us in the Hotspot Podcast channel in the Helium Discord. You gotta scroll way, way, way down. It's under the special category, but I promise you it's there. Also, one more important thing. If you're in the United States and you have not gotten started with Helium mining and you are looking to do so, my company Fairspot gives free miners to people with 70% of the share to keep for yourself with payouts every Friday. You can apply at fairspot.host. We have a one hotspot per host limit. Our goal is to get as many people as possible included in the Helium network, and you will do best applying to us if you are on the edge of existing coverage. We are really trying to expand coverage as much as possible. You can find more information in the link in the description. I hope you all have a great day and best of luck deploying your Helium hotspots. Thank you for tuning into the hotspot. If you love our content, don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. And if you want to maximize your impact, leave your honest review on Apple Podcasts. Your support helps us reach more listeners and educate them about the Helium Network.